Okay. Thank you. Well, can't okay. you dereference? Maybe I'm just confused. Like, why can't you dereference in the load instruction? Uh, you you do dereference in the load instruction, but you need yeah. two LDRs here. You need uh, either uh, well uh, an LDR into let's say x zero of a label, right? Then you need to LDR uh, into let's say x one from x zero. Then the add. And then the store. Okay. I guess I just didn't expect us to be loading into a label or loading a label. I thought we were just loading a number. Well, uh, you're not loading a number. You're loading an address. So there are different ways of, of getting the address, but you have to get the address before you can dereference it. Okay. So if you entered four, I'll give you credit. If you entered five, I'll give you credit, but three and the other answers will not get credit. Oops, that was the wrong thing. Uh, oh, did I do the whole thing? Yeah, that, that was the whole exam. Anybody have questions? So let me write myself a note. Uh, so if the answer was four, you have a point. Uh, min construction count. All right, and then what was the other one? We wanna remove, oh, the uh, negative 28. Uh, if minus 28 question wrong, give point. Okay. So those are the two points I've got. Okay. Anybody have questions? Um, for the question that's like, this code is not complete and describe with main. What I thought the question was, um, it was explain what this did. Um, I didn't think about what was after it. So um, that, that was confusing is, to me. Is it this one or? That no, one. This one. Um, well, this, this here is a real smoking gun. That's, that's bad. And that was the point of the question. Okay. Okay. So with that in our past, I'll make the adjustments to uh, the scores. And uh, I'm no longer accepting uh, rework for your projects. So if, uh, if you've sent in uh, new submissions, I've, I believe I've graded them. Just confirm that I have. So for example, the last one that I got was Jordan. Yeah. Okay. Nate says we're good. So therefore we are good. Now I'll start accepting them again. I just need a break from grading, okay? So um, figure, let a couple of weeks go by. And then if you wanna go back uh, and add work that you're missing, then do it then. I just, I just need a break from grading. Okay. Uh, let's see, also didn't turn on the, the closed captioning. The video Please. streaming quality is very amazing. My stream- oh, sent us an email about everything. And what did they say? Let me open it. Um, Talking about work on our network on campus. I think did, that. They did that last night, though. It's supposed yeah, to be yeah and then they messed up something. Basically, saying the ISP messed up, and we have 
uh, significantly reduced capacity. As we do not have forecasted, as we do not have a forecasted time frame for return to normal service, we ask members of the Carthage community to avoid unnecessary internet traffic on campus and plan for a potential disruption until the issue is solved. Well, at least I can still hear everybody, but the, the video is really poor, yeah. Like I'm getting black screens every time the, the highlighted speaker changes. Okay, how about um, uh, everybody uh, see if it get any better if you all turn off your cameras. Okay, and of course I'll leave mine on because uh, I, I, I have to. Uh, it's still so around. I, don't, okay. I don't think any difference. There's something else you can try. Let me take a look. Uh, Okay. Well, yeah, I'm not seeing anything else that you can do to improve. Okay, uh, let's go over the next project, which uh, is project five. And I don't need this. Where am I? Okay. Oh, I'm, I can use this. Okay. Uh, I'll change what I'm displaying in a moment. All right. Uh, I can't show it from here without the arm machine. I was getting accustomed to doing it on my other Mac. So I'm just going to switch computers. I will be right back. Don't go anywhere. Uh, I'm just going to switch computers. Um, nope. And here, launch meeting. I'm making progress. Okay, now I'll let everybody share their screen. And then I'll go share the screen on the other computer. Um, okay, good. All right. Uh, where am I going? Okay, so this program requires uh, to do anything interesting, it requires some command line options. It occurs to me that some of you may have may never implemented command line options in C and C++. So we'll cover that today's class. But uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, at something more reasonable. Uh, so uh, dot slash a dot out dash s. Let's give uh, 10 million. One, one, two, three, one, two, three. And let's give it a number of iterations of 10 iterations. Okay. So dash s followed by a number sets the size of the, of the problem. And dash i is the number of times that you have to repeat the problem. Okay, so there are a total of four uh, lines output. And what you're seeing is uh, two groups of two. Let me let this dog out. Uh, all right. So it's okay, it's super hot in here. They'll just leave the door open. Okay, so what you're seeing is two groups of two. Well, first, it's going to tell you, you have to print this 
figuring out uh, how much memory the program is going to use for data. And it's gonna be 114 megabytes. It's gonna do 10 iterations. Uh, it's discovered that you have eight cores available. And then it will do single core timing using two methods. One call I call naive, I give you that code. And the other is using the NEON instruction set. This is the part of the course where we learn how to make sense of SIMD, the single instruction, multiple data instructions. So here you're seeing that uh, some calculation, I haven't told you what it is yet, uh, normally will run in 0 0.0036 seconds per iteration. But if you substitute NEON instructions, uh, it runs in only two thirds the time. So you get a performance increase of, uh, uh, which way does it go? It's uh, 33%, okay? And then it's going to do threaded timing. So this is also the part of the course where you're gonna learn about uh, a little bit about threading. This is your introduction to threading. And what's disappointing though, is uh, you, you can't really do anything with this problem anymore uh, uh, and see that the, uh, the, the multi-threaded time is actually faster. So don't worry about the fact that 0 0.002603 is lower than 0 0.002365. Just don't worry about it. Uh, so what is this program doing? Uh, it is doing the following. And so the problem is there is an array of floats. So here is the array of floats. And let's call this one, this array A. And the length of this array is determined by the dash S option. Got it? Okay, so use your reaction icons to signify if you don't want to turn on your cameras today. So does anybody have any questions on the dash S? It determines the size of this array. Okay, then there's another array which is exactly the same size called B. And then there is another array exactly the same size called C. Okay. Now what this program does is to fill A and B with random numbers between zero and one. So in, on the average, here's a 0 0.5. And on the average, here's a 0 0.5. And then using either a naive approach or a SIMD approach, you're gonna take uh, the same index in A, add it to the same index in B and write it to the same index in C. So A sub I plus B sub I equals C sub I. Okay, so on average, that's gonna be a one. So everybody got the premise? Okay. Can you say that again? Okay, so, uh, so, so, yeah, so think of it like this, for int uh, i equals zero, i less than uh, that size parameter that you can specify on the command line, i plus plus. And what this program does is c i is equal to a i plus B I. That's what this program does.
So then to make sure that you are doing it correctly, uh, C will then be summed up on the last iteration. Let's say you tell it to do dash I 10. So on the 10th iteration, it'll do a check value by adding up all of the members of C and you should get a number which is close to the value for S. So uh, going back here, uh, I have to uh, stop sharing. It doesn't work the other way around. So going back to here. Uh, so if uh, we were to run with just the standard default, so I'm eliminating the dash S, that defaults to 128 floats. So notice that the check value is close to 128. The discrepancy is due to randomness. What is critically important, however, is if those four check values are not identical, you've got a bug. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, sorry, the internet's buggy. Um, could you just briefly explain again what that iteration of 10 means? You say after 10 spaces, it'll do a check and see if it's close to the S parameter. I just didn't really understand what the right. iteration's purpose was. So uh, this is a standard practice for doing timings on a computer. So when you're timing something, the computer is doing other things, right? So maybe uh, the disk is active, maybe the uh, uh, network is active. So if you time something once, you can't really be sure that you're getting an accurate value. So that's why typically when you're timing something on a computer, you might, you might time it a hundred times and take the average. In this case, the dash I parameter is that number of times. So for instance, uh, here, it's gonna do the calculation once. And notice I got timing of zero. Uh, naive and neon time is zero. Okay, but now let's put in dash I of um, 10,000. Uh, and let's give it a size that's a little bit larger. So dash S uh, 10,000. Okay, now what's here to notice is that the timings ought to be similar to each other because I'm running it a thousand times or 10,000 times. So it's 0 0.06, 0 0.06, 0 0.06, right? Okay. Okay, I understand a little bit more. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, what it comes down to is when you're timing something on a computer, you repeat the experiment many times and take the average. Okay. Now, uh, so let's uh, go through the uh, README and then we will start diving into what all of this means. All right, so let's go to, um, what am I doing, GitHub? Uh, here is the class, here are the projects, let's go to P5 and There's one more thing. There's one more file I have to give you, which I'm glad I checked. 
Uh, I'm going to give you the actual program itself. Uh, no, am I? No, I'm not. I think I am correct the way that I'm having it here. Well, let's see, what about the timing? Do I give anything about the timing? All right, so I owe you uh, some sample code for an accurate time, okay? So uh, the program supports three options. Dash H prints this help. Dash S uh, allows you to specify the size. The size must default to 128 if the option is missing. Now your job though is to make sure the size is not exactly what I you specified, but you have to take that value, whatever the value is, and round it up to the nearest 16. The reason why it must be divisible by 16, and your code has to make it divisible by 16, uh, is because you're going to operate on 16 floats at a time. Okay. By the way, this uh, program is in C and C++. It is not in assembly language. Do I have any reactions? Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. No. Okay, you contrary and you. Okay. So the default value for the number of iterations is one. So in order, so in, in the command line, we're gonna say dash H dash S, whatever, dash H being the help. Um, if, is, are we gonna, how do we figure out if the, the, is it using argv? If it's like, if dash S, we take the next value as. Yeah, uh, that, see, yeah, we're gonna cover that because I, I, uh, I imagine most of you have not ever used getopt, G-E-T-O-P-T. So I'm going to give you a quick lesson on getopt, okay? Got yeah. it, Jordan? And do you think you could go through a quick demo of like a simplified usage of SIMD, like a really basic implementation of it, just to sort of get yep. Yep. what the syntax right. is? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you a complete explanation as, uh, as what the SIMD instruction in this program is going to do. Uh, and also, another lesson in this program is how to leverage fancy uh, assembly language instructions without actually using assembly language. And that's something called an intrinsic. Okay. So uh, you want these. Uh, and you'll need to compile using pthread and C++ threading requires C++ 11 or later. So some compilers default to earlier than 11. So you'll need to specify uh, what standard to use. So the minimum to get this program working properly is 11. I know, Cephas, what do you use, 21? My, my expectation like is you use the latest one available. It's like 20A or something, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Well, pick whatever version you want, but it has to be at least 11. All right, now, these arrays have to be memory aligned. Their length must be a multiple of 16 and the first member of each array has to appear at an address that is, is itself a multiple of 16. So that's why I'm using aligned alloc. So what this says is do a malloc of this size but make sure that it starts on an address that's a multiple of 16. Now it turns out in C++ 17, they added 
uh, capability to the new operator so that you don't have to use the line Dalek anymore. But we're just going to ignore that, right? The 17? Uh, the new function, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do your memory allocation this way for now. I just wanted to let you know that C++ 17 adds a new feature. Can I use new just, just cause? Okay. So you're gonna write a function that computes a random number between zero and one inclusive. And then you're gonna fill A and B with the random numbers. You can do that once, right? So you fill with A and B with random data, and then you're going to do the summations some number of times due to the iteration count, but you're not gonna change A or B, you're only gonna change C. So fill the A and B just once for no matter how many iterations you're gonna run and uh, they will each average, each member in the two arrays will be an average of 0.5. So adding 0.5 on average to 0 0.5 on average will on average give you one. Actually, okay. Professor, I do kind of have a question though. All right, maybe uh, I have a kind of answer. Uh, we, you're asking us to write a loop in the next function, but what do you mean by points will be deflected if you code your own loop when you, um, are you referring to the single core function or something else? Um, <clears throat> this is for the zeroing out of, uh, of, the, uh, of an array. Just use memset. Don't write your own loop. Right. Okay, now you've used memset, right? Because you used it in project uh, three. Now it's critical, it's critical that you zero out C before each iteration. Because if you don't, and there's values left around in C that could corrupt your answer and hide a bug. So memset C before each iteration. Okay, so I'm giving you single core, which takes four operands, a pointer to the A uh, array, pointer to the B array, pointer to the C array, and the size. So that is going to be, you know, nothing more than, um, that will enable you to do this, okay, but this is not part of the program. Right, so it'll enable you to, let's say, say um, star C plus plus equals star A plus 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 star B plus plus. Okay, that's a different way of writing this. Okay, then, you, so that will, uh, this is the function that performs the additions between the two arrays to make a third array. Uh, and the single core version is, uh, is the naive, this is the naive implementation. You also need to write sum of sums. And sum of sums will add up the C array. So sum of sums will add up all of these values and you should get something which is close to the size of the array in elements, not in bytes. Any questions? Okay, so here is my implementation of single core. You, you should use this. Now, notice that this 
uh, there are 16 of these lines. The reason why there are 16 specifically is that I'm using loop unrolling to increase performance. Has anyone uh, not heard of loop unrolling before? I have not. I have not. Okay. I have it's not. A, a delicious time to learn some new knowledge. So here's the idea of loop unrolling. Uh, so for int i equals zero, i is less than uh, 10, doesn't matter what it's less than, i plus plus, and, um, he, and what are we going to do in the loop? We're going to do um, uh, uh, print, uh, this is a terrible example. Um, foo. So I'm not telling you what we're going to do. But let's say foo is really short. So how many times do we have to manipulate I compared to how many times we call foo? Let me ask you a different question. Do we seem to be using the value of I for anything other than controlling the loop? No. Oh. Correct. So my first question was, compare the number of times we're manipulating I to the number of times that we're calling foo. We're there manipulating I. Well, go ahead. They're Plus equal. One more time. They're equal. Right. So where uh, the amount of work being done here, half of the work, so to speak, is wasted work. It's overhead. Half of the work here is being invested into I. And we're not even using I except for uh, controlling the loop. So how about this? Uh, what if we, instead of this loop, we just said this. 10 times. Wouldn't the compiler already do this? It depends. The so this loop unrolling is one of the uh, is one of the standard optimization techniques used, but it depends. Somebody else had a question. So this is simply to save the memory used by I, and also the run the time it takes to increment I. Uh, yes. Yeah, so forget about the memory. Uh, that's that's not important. Okay. The point More. is, it's the work. Okay. So in, in this example, half of the work is going into maintaining I. Okay. And in this example, 100% of the work is going into foo. Okay. Although okay. if foo is a non-trivial function, the amount of work in incrementing I is going to be largely irrelevant. You're absolutely right. But uh, with that said, what is our equivalent of foo? Well, our equivalent of foo is this, so it is trivial, right? So do you, would you agree, Cephas, that uh, this is not an example of an appreciable amount of work? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what is loop unrolling then? This is, uh, this here is the previous loop fully unrolled, which is not practical in general. So what you're seeing here in my code is I'm going to manip, I'm still keeping I as a loop counter, but I'm doing 16 useful 
pieces of work for each manipulation of I, which is considered overhead and wasted work. So I have unrolled this loop 16 times. Got it? So in order to account for the unrolling by 16, I have modified the size by dividing by 16 because each time through this loop counts as 16 iterations of the original with no unrolling. Oh, wow. Okay, I understand it. And I see why you did it. Can you say that again? Okay, so if let, let's take some uh, def, uh, concrete numbers. Let's say your size was 100, right? So, uh, so naively, you would loop 100 times doing one piece of work, correct? Yeah. Okay, now let's say instead of doing one piece of work, I do 10 pieces of work. My size is still 100, but if I divide that 100 by 10, precisely the number of times I've unrolled the loop, then I do 10 units of work 10 times, and that'll be the same as doing one unit of work 100 times. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. I didn't even see the where you divided by 16. That was where I was getting confused. Got it. Okay, two more things here. Uh, a few more things here. Uh, do you know what a cert is? Have you used a cert? Any, uh, don't, don't be bashful. Anyone uh, not used a cert before? No, not before. No. Nope. Uh, okay, before. excellent. So uh, let's go back to the uh, iPad. Uh, in C, you would include assert dot h in c plus plus this by the way will work in c or c plus plus but in c plus plus you can also do include c assert okay so that's how you get access to assert it comes to you from an include file then the way that it's used is you would say assert something. Okay, and what's gonna happen is if something evaluates to true, nothing happens. Else, in other words, it is evaluated to false. Else, crash. Insta death. Okay, so here's the value. Uh, I've got some great memes that I made on this because I'm just like the world's foremost expert on debugging. So I, I, I have such high level skill that I can make memes about it, but I don't have them ready for this class. Uh, but the point of those memes is that typically, a crash uh, does it is not instantaneous, right? Typically, there is a bug which sets into motion a series of unfortunate events that result in a crash. So an assert can stop a bug in its tracks. 
you'll get a crash the instant you notice something is wrong. That is the value of the assert. Also, assert will tell you exactly what line number and what condition failed in the crash output. Okay, so you want to know if, so th uh, think of it this way. Um, and here's one of my, my great memes. I think it's a great meme. It got an impossibly large number of upvotes on Reddit, so it must be good. All right, the uh, picture, a locomotive buried in the ground. It was a derailment. The locomotive is a smoking mess buried in the dirt. Okay, that's a crash. If you're looking for the bug, that's way up the track. The bug is where the wheels started coming off the tracks. The crash is the end result of the bug. Okay, so assert will be there in your code watching for that figurative moment where the wheels come off the tracks. Okay, any questions about the role and value of a cert? Why did we not learn this sooner? Beats the hell out of me. I learned it back in CS2. We were making a um, poker game, and we had to use something similar to a cert. Mm hmm Okay. But, uh, you know, that's part of the value of this course. This course is, is the comp world course is where you learn a lot of the truth that's been hidden from you before. Okay, how things really work. All right, so uh, I'm starting to write one big gotcha. It's own asserts are only present when you compile um, pile in debug mode. If you turn on the optimizer to get faster code, asserts become no ops. They don't do anything. So the only time that asserts are actually present in your code is when you compile it with debugging on. All right, back to this code. So explain to me what this is doing. Uh, just checking if there's code or if there's anything at that location. Anybody else? I know the ampersand, I think, indicates bitwise operations, but I don't really understand what's happening more than that. Okay, so is it that, trying to catch if the case is equal to zero, like the the original part of the case? If it's equal to zero, that usually zero usually means a null value, right? It, yes, zero does indicate a null value typically, but what this is doing is ensuring that the argument that is passed as size is a multiple of sixteen. So think about it. You wrote this function, and part of the definition of this function is the size must be a multiple of 16. Well, you don't trust the user of your function. You don't trust them. That's how airplanes fall out of the sky. Instead, you're going to check. To write robust code, you should be checking to make sure that your arguments seem correct. 
So there's more assertions that I could have made. For example, I could assert that A is not null and B is not null and C is not null. That would have been appropriate. So if you know something to be true, you can assert it. So this says, I claim size is a multiple of 16. And if it isn't, I'm gonna crash right here. Okay, something tells me it might be good time for a demo. So let me give you a terminal. Um, let's share that. Um, include C assert. Um, all right, let's get in. Um, Okay, uh, use, use, okay, using namespace uh, std and main. Uh, yeah, I'll do it this way. Uh, int argc char star star argv uh, if uh, argc less than two. Um, just Exit. All right, and then uh, int uh, i equals a to i of um, uh, r v sub one, and here comes my assert of um, i and zero x f equals zero and return zero. Okay, so this program doesn't do anything. It's just gonna, it's just a demo of a cert. All right, so G plus plus foo dot CPP. Client sucks. All right, what is my problem here? Call object type int is not a function. There's nothing wrong with this. The story of my life. All right, well, maybe I can convince it. Uh, Maybe I'll convince it to feel better if I just add that. Well, just speed jobs, go suck farts out of train seats. That's what I have to say. What the hell's wrong with this? There's nothing wrong with this. Uh, let's try it and see. Yeah, you forgot a uh, a semicolon. I did. Yes, and it's thinking that the int is part of the assert line. All right. Well, Steve Jobs should still suck farts out of train seats, but okay. Yes, I did miss a semicolon. Okay. So a dot out. And it just exits, but I didn't give it anything. So here's 16. Now here's 15. Crash. And not only that, it tells you the, the, the nice line number and what failed.
Now, if Apple is true to everyone else, this should not have the assert in it, but it does. So screw you, Apple. Anyway, so the last point that I made may not be true. Uh, assert is supposed to disappear if you're not in debug mode. So that way it gets out of your code. You don't slow down your code by checking for errors. Stupid Apple. Okay, any questions? Next, do you know what this is? You're not seeing that, are you? Uh, before Thomas could uh, tell me, I caught it myself. Do you know what that is? Anybody? Doesn't that return the name of the function? Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at uh, some handy dandy built-ins. Uh, so uh, now I'm in C, so printf uh, s, s, and d. So here's file, dunder, file, dunder, dunder, function, dunder, and dunder, line, dunder. So that tells you what file you're in, what the name of the function that you're in, and what line the uh, line appears on. So what's great about that is for doing printf for debugging or logging. And no matter how you abuse the preprocessor, line will still be correct. Right, because if you print it out, if you print it, if you put in a constant of five here, uh, that that's correct. But uh, remember that going through the preprocessor, this isn't uh, all of these things are going to be expanded to thousands of lines. So under dunder line dunder correctly figures out what is the true line number in your code. Okay, so look at all the positive, uh, the, all the incredible things you're learning today. Any questions? No? Okay, so this is the naive approach. And uh, uh, this is one of the functions that you will time. Now, uh, let's get into SIMD. The idea behind SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. So SIMD uh, single instruction, multiple data. Let's take a look at your arrays. Here's A, here's B, here's C. So we're going to use the SIMD instruction for adding four floats. So that's a single instruction with multiple data. So it's instead of working on this one plus this one equals this one, it's in the same single instruction going to do a total of four floats. So it's going to be these four plus these four gets put into these four. Okay. Now to do that on the ARM architecture, 
They do that using a, an instruction set they call NEON. And NEON gives a load of SIMD instructions that can operate on eight uh, bytes at once or um, it can operate on uh, four floats at once, for example, uh, two longs, for example. So actually it wouldn't be eight bytes, it would be 16 bytes. So notice uh, two times eight is 16, four times four is 16, and 16 times one is 16. And you can also do eight shorts at the same time. Eight times two is 16. What does NEON stand for? No idea. I think it's a marketing term. I wish I could tell you. Now, Intel has similar thing. Every, every processor maker in the modern world uh, for high performance has uh, SIMD instructions. So in order to use this instruction, it would be something like some type of fancy mnemonic. And then there would be just like all the other, let's say we're doing ads. Uh, it would just like all the other ads instructions, it'll be three uh, operands. It'll be, uh, you know, a destination and then operand one and operand two. But in this case, this is gonna be a pointer that's going to be a pointer and that's going to be a pointer. Okay, so your pointer, uh, let's say operand one, that might be a pointer inside of A. So the operands to the addition are going to be at address that you give as the pointer and then the float next to it, and then the float next to it, and then the float next to it again. So you're gonna work on all four floats in the same instruction. All right. So this is the actual instruction that you're going to use, but that's an assembly language. And we don't wanna use assembly language in this project. So instead, we're gonna use an intrinsic. So an intrinsic is something that looks like the higher level language, but actually just injects the assembly language after a little bit of massaging. So let's take a look at the includes that you need. And that is where you're going to get the ARM NEON instruction set intrinsics, okay? Then you can make use of, so by the way, here is a link to a document which explains the intrinsics. And you can see there's a hell of a lot of these instructions. Uh, what is it, 146 pages worth? Is that right? Let's see what happens on page 146. Yep, still going. So there's 146 pages of uh, intrinsics available to you. But it's things like, okay, so... Um, uh, this is going to do 16 bytes. Uh, this one is going to do um, four ints. This one's going to do 
uh, wow, uh, 64 bytes at once. Okay, so new types have been invented to support the, uh, the intrinsics, the SIMD. So let's look here. So you've got int, right? And you've got float. Well, you'll need a type to properly represent four floats. So for example, if you had float A4, well, how do you get the size of that? It's not straightforward. So instead, there are there is a new type float. Um, uh, I know it's in the document, but I'm trying to come up with it from memory. So 32 by four underscore T. Let's see how far off I was. Let's go back to the document. Float 32 times four. Uh, yep, I got it right. So this is the type that you'll be using in this program. Float 32, each float is 32 bits long and there are four of them in this variable. And that's done so that the compiler can do address arithmetic correctly. Okay. So here's the discussion of uh, the new types. So you're going to write a function that uses the intrinsic. It has the same calling convention, the same signature as this one. Single core, float, uh, pointer to float, pointer to float, pointer to float in an int. Okay, then down here, you're going to write intrinsic. Pointer to float, pointer to float, pointer to float, int. Okay. All right, any questions about what an intrinsic is? Can somebody tell me a single sentence definition? Intrinsics are proxies for assembly language instructions that are callable directly from C and C++. Yep, and I just realized that I have pretty much that on screen right now, but you're exactly right. Yes. So they're proxies, higher level language proxies for specific assembly language instructions uh, that the compilers know about and are able to uh, implement for you. Okay. So now you understand why I had you do unroll the loop 16 times, because the intrinsic is going to work on four at a time and you're gonna unroll that loop four times, four times four is 16. So to make sure it's apples and apples, unroll, unroll the naive 16 times the fancy one that you're, you're going to write is unrolled four times. But each time is working on four floats, four times four is 16. Okay, any questions so far? Anybody? Nothing? Okay. Uh, as part of your multi-threaded version, this is your introduction to C++ th threading. Uh, now, threads, are, um, well, let's just see, uh, what, what do you think the definition of a thread is? Before we go over threading, this is like your pretest. What do you think, what is your understanding of what a thread is? A 
doesn't a thread string thing string parts code lines together so it's like you can string a line that does two things instead of one another mm, no no um let me ask a different question so threads are somewhat like processes but what's the difference Can't a thread run a process, meaning multiple threads can run multiple processes at the same time? Uh, you're getting warmer, but you're running afoul of the technicalities of the definition. So let's take a look at the iPad. Can I guess just because? What? I said, can I guess just because? Yeah, you can guess. Um. So if you were threading a single function, the thread would be multiple iterations of the same function. So it'd be doing the same function multiple times. Mm. Nope. Nope. Okay. So here's a process. It's a happy little process. This is a Bob Ross process. And you got a nice little door and some windows. And in your process, you have uh, some happy little people, okay? So you can run more than one process at a time. So here's another process. Okay, so there's two processes. Now here's, uh, Here's Bob's process and here's Mary's process. Now, when Bob goes to his refrigerator, whose refrigerator does he go to? Mary's. Come on. No. He goes to his own. Right. And when Mary goes to her refrigerator, whose refrigerator does she go to? The one Hers. she has in her house. Right, right. So instead of refrigerator, let's talk memory. They're both, they both have the same house, right? It was like cookie cutter design of a house. So they both have um, uh, refrigerators. In terms of programming, they, it's the same program. So they both have global variables Z. And when Bob goes to fetch a value from Z, whose value does he get? Bob's. When Mary goes to fetch global variable Z, whose global variable Z does she get? She gets Mary's. Because these are two executing units in different address spaces. Now let's compare that to putting Bob and Mary together in the same address space. So here's Bob and here's Mary, and they're both happy. Now, when Bob goes to his refrigerator, whose refrigerator does he get? His, but it's also the same one that Mary would go to because they're in the same house. They're in the same address space. So something like a global variable Z is now shared. So this is a Bob thread, and this is a Mary thread. They're both concurrently executing within a single address space. So unlike two processes with a single thread, this is one process with two threads. So there are two execution units right now but they're sharing the address space. And that is a thread. So a thread has also been called a lightweight. I don't like this term. It's called a lightweight process. I don't think it's a good word, but you may have heard, you may hear of it described that way. So threads are multiple executing 
units sharing one address space. Okay, so what we're going to be learning about right now is C++ threading. C++ threading is based upon and built upon a library called pthread, POSIX threading. That is why in order to link a program that uses C++ threading, you have to specify dash pthread. That's part of the linker. Okay, now here is a trivial example of C++ threading. All you have to do to create a thread is to declare it. And this one's going to create a thread. This uh, FIRST is a C++ thread that's going to execute foo with no arguments. SECOND second is a C++ thread that's going to execute bar with one argument, namely an int. So whatever parameter, this is very cool actually, whatever parameters you put here will show up as parameters in your function. This is called the worker. So foo is a worker and bar is a worker. So you're specifying create a thread called first and have it work on the worker named foo. So basically when you get when the, the program gets the, the first line, it part of it starts running foo and then it goes to the next line and then part of the computer is running bar. Okay. Correct. Whereas like a normal program, when it got to the first line, it would immediately just run foo. It wouldn't do anything else. Correct. So in a normal program, calling foo happens sequentially. After foo completes, then bar would run sequentially. But with threading, you've got more than one thing happening at the same time. And believe me, that's enough to make your head hurt until you get used to it. Because heretofore, your entire education in CS has been premised on the idea that the computer executes one instruction after the other. And now that we're gonna learn about threading, that basic assumption is no longer true. How do you feel? I have a question from Cephas because Cephas does not have a microphone. Cephas says, what is the difference between threads, coroutines, and subroutines? Okay, that's a really cool question, Cephas. Thank you. Uh, okay, now what's, I noticed there are 16 items in the chat. What's all that? Do I need to look at it? Most of it is Cephas asking the question. Okay, got it. You know, Steve, I'm just going to call you Fred from now on. So I'm, 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 you know, enough names. I'm just going to call you Fred. Or Peter. I'm going to call you Peter. Okay. So uh, the question was, Peter's question was, yeah, let's make it Fred. Fred's question was, uh, Fred? versus coroutine versus subroutine? That is an excellent question, Fred. All right, so uh, these two are more like each other than thread. 
So threads are different executing units. All right? So within the same address space. The coroutine is related to subroutine. Subroutine is what you're accustomed to. So the way that a subroutine looks is kind of like this. Here's your code. Code. You make a function call. So you go to the function call, to the function. You execute the function until it completes, and then it returns where it left off and continues. Okay, so that is a subroutine. Namely, a function the way that you've always thought of functions. Now let's talk about a coroutine, which really is not used very much anymore. But here's your code. You call a function, and the function code here, but for some reason, it does not complete, it instead calls something in your code. So you execute a bit and then your code calls back to the coroutine. It continues where it left off and then perhaps finally returns to the code. So here is the coroutine where it's going to part of it's going to execute and then stop where it ever it stops and part of your code will execute and then stop by calling the coroutine back and forth ping ponging until one or the other completes or both complete. But this is the fundamental difference between subroutines and coroutines where they're both function calls, they both look like function calls, but a coroutine is written in such a way that it does not come to its complete state, but it can still return to you. It can return to you before it's finished. And then with the theory being is that at some point you'll go back to it and let it finish. Does that help? Uh, why should I get angry with you, Fred? Oh, Jordan. Why should I get angry with who? Who am I going to get angry at? I thought it was another one of those random Cephas questions. No, it's a great question. Has anybody? Well, look at this way. How, how many people heard of coroutines before? I hadn't heard of a coroutine before today. Yeah. Now coroutines used to be a lot more common, but they're not common anymore at all. Because, well, frankly, they're difficult to manage. They're difficult to get right. So they sort of went decreased in popularity. Okay. All right. So let's see, where was I? I would think I was showing you uh, sample code. Now it's only two minutes left to class. This isn't enough to get you started. So I'll push the uh, due date back by a few days. And on Tuesday, we'll continue where we left off here. Only I will show more concrete examples, including how to use getopt. We haven't gone over that either yet. So in the remaining minute, questions? Any questions? Anybody going to go to the barbecue tonight? I have a feeling Cephas might. You mean Fred? Yeah, Freddy. I mean, yeah. he has to be addicted to something other than traps for once. Addicted to something other than traps? I, I don't understand that. Scooby-Doo. Uh, I was referencing Scooby-Doo. You called him Fred. Oh, okay. 
Well, it could have been other Freds. It could have been Fred Allen. Yeah, fair. Fred McMurray. From Wisconsin, by the way. Okay, then I guess uh, I'll, I'll be at the barbecue too. Uh, I hope to see you then. We can continue this, the discussion tonight. Uh, if not, I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>